excited about today's show. My guests today are smart, they are controversial, and they are really one of a kind. No, they're two of a kind. Watch this. They're known as the most powerful husband and wife team in Hollywood. Roseanne and Tom Arnold are in their glory days with their own his and her TV shows. But their real lives have been anything but a TV sitcom. Both have admitted to being sexually abused as children and revealed their stories to the public on our show. Their names are spread all over the headlines. Substance abuse, compulsive eating, vulgar actions, mud wrestling. The couple is constantly fighting the tabloids, but lately they've emerged as America's hottest couple and they say they've always been crazy about each other. Just look at them now. Roseanne has gone from a suburban housewife in flannel shirts to a sexy glamour girl in hot designer clothes. And Tom, once a meat packer in a slaughterhouse, is getting in shape. He's lost more than 100 pounds and has made a name for himself in Tinseltown. His new hit sitcom, The Jackie Thomas Show, pokes fun at the rumors of Roseanne and Tom's real life. And despite being called a gold digger who married Roseanne just for her money, Tom Arnold has come out on top. Ladies and gentlemen, would you give a nice warm welcome to the star of a new hit series, The Jackie Thomas Show, his name, Mr. Tom Arnold. comfortable with someone can you start an interview by saying how you doing good yeah you? you do feel I feel comfortable with you too. <laughs> how I, are you doing? I'm doing real good real good we've been you know it's been hectic yeah. filming both shows and everything and uh, it's been pretty pretty hectic but doing real good I don't know how you do that how do you do that I are budget... you still working on her I'm not... oh yeah I run her show well I budget my time you know we don't uh, do anything past five o'clock you know so we can still have time with the kids Aww. and each other <laughs> It's tough, Nothing though. past five o'clock. Well, <laughs> actually, it's better in the morning. And that's but, uh, the end of know. the interview. <laughs> <laughs> Men always say that. It's not true. Ask Rose. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> hey, you started it. That's exactly right. Well, you know, we're doing that, too, because, you know, we got the shows, and then we got the trying to have a baby, which in itself is, you know, that's every month, you know, every, oh. oh. Why do you want to, why do you want to have a baby? Why do I want to have a baby? Well, I've never had, you know, I have my stepchildren, I love them everything, but, uh, you know, they're teenagers, and, uh, but I want, you know, a little, I want one that likes me, too. So, uh, I'm, you know, no, I, 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 I never had a baby, and I, I, I ask myself that question, do I just want to do this because yeah. I have such a big ego that I think, you know, because odds are the baby, you know, will probably be an alcoholic because I'm an alcoholic, you know, there's a lot of things you pass on. You know, but yet, you know, we can we can work through that as a family, and uh, Tom, I'll take him to his first meeting. You know, they don't four years old. <laughs> they don't always like you when they're your children. Right, that's so true. So you're wrong about you want one that'll like. I you. know, I'm kidding about that. Well, they do up until they're about teenagers. Yes. They really think you're cool, and then something happens. But I, you know, I would love to have a, a baby. You know, and and uh, and then. Do you know how much trouble it is to lug all that stuff around? Can you see you with a diaper bag? Absolutely. I see. I mean, my family back in Iowa. You know, I'm the oldest of seven. I changed diapers all the way down for my brothers and sisters. Oh, you did. My okay. stepmother has a daycare center in the house. So I mean, I have a lot of experience on this stuff. And when it's your own baby, it's got to be even better. I hope. <laughs> so, well, we we are fortunate enough to be able to have a nanny and a night nurse. <laughs> you know, but I want to play with the baby and everything. Bring them in, play with them, take them away. Right. That may be the, uh, you know, of course. I want to hang out with the baby. I am not. <laughs> Babies, do, what do you mean hang out with the baby? Just hang, have you ever hung out, you just look at them and they do stuff and they just are, they're just, they're incredible. They do, they surprise you constantly. They don't do that. They just, uh... <laughs> am I right? Is this guy living in a fantasy world? <laughs> in the audience who've had a baby raise your hand does he know what he's talking about okay you all go. you men with little babies am i right or am i right, right. they're fun they're cool you come home from work and they're there they're big funny faces and everything they're just great i 
am not quite sure. I know you worked in a meat packing plant, and I know people tried to arrest you. And I saw, believe it or not, when I was in some foreign country, part of a special where you said, this is my hometown of... Ottumwa, Iowa. Ottumwa, Iowa. Iowa, yeah. That's a wonderful, funny name. Yeah, it's an Indian name. It's as funny as Hoboken, you know? Yeah, it is. There are names that are just great and funny, but at, I don't know about you as a young person. I could have uh, gotten a bio and read it up, but it's easier to hear it from you. Well, you I... You had a large family. You we had a large family, seven. and I was the oldest. You know, we started oh, out... Oh, it's always the oldest that wants to be the star. Yeah. A lot of times, or the youngest. There's always... The, the oldest or the youngest are always weird. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Rosie's the oldest, too. I'm the oldest. Are you? We're yeah. weird. All three of us. <laughs> Maybe that's the reason. Yeah. What was this uh, This family? Ottumwa is yeah. how many people? It's about 27,000. That's manageable. It's pretty big. You know, for Iowa, it's a pretty good-sized town. Tell me about this family. Well, we uh, grew, you know, my dad and mom got married very young. They were, uh, I think, 18 and 16. When they had you, they were there? They had me soon after, uh, maybe a year and a half or so after. And uh, then they had my sister a year after me, and then another brother a year after that. And uh, it was a stressful... There was a lot of stress on the marriage, and uh, they got divorced when I was four, and uh, they went to, uh, this was in the early 60s, you know, and they went to court to see who got the kids, and it was, my dad wanted custody, she wanted custody, and, and uh, my grandma said to my dad, my, why don't you just, I have a feeling that if you drop this case, that you're going to get the kids. And uh, the day after, it was the day before they put the kids on the stand to say which parent they wanted to be with, you know, and I was like four, my dad didn't want to do that, so he dropped it. My mother got custody. The day after that, she came out to his office and said, here's the keys to the house. The kids are with the babysitter. They're yours. Why did she want to just get them in name only? Well, I mean, why do that? That was the best gift that my mother really? ever gave to me by giving us to, to my father. Because she, uh, she, was, uh, she, she eventually married seven times. She, was, she, had the, you know, she had the same disease that I have. And, uh, you know, it's a tough, it's tough. And, and maybe some, somewhere inside of her she said, I'm not going to be the mother or the parent that these guys are going to need. And my father was, and he was great. And so I, I thank her for that. She's dead, but I do thank her for that. I mean, it was a wonderful thing. When did she pass on? She passed away, uh, I think it was October 26th of uh, 1992. And she had been uh, suffering with uh, uh, heart troubles. And she was about 51, I think, and she died very young. She's very young. Yeah. And she'd had some heart troubles and had a stroke. And she had a tough, tough life. and. Uh, you know, it was uh, it was tough, and now she just wasn't wasn't happy, and and now she's at peace. So that's that's good. Did you ever have a relationship with her at all? I had. Uh, well, you know, when I was a kid, she used to call and come over about you know every three months or so, and it was like uh, you know it was exciting to see her because she always gave me a dollar, you know, and then I'd go to the store and buy ten <laughs> ten candy bars and eat them all, you know. <laughs> had a problem and uh <laughs> you know i mean she tried and she'd call us and uh you know but she you know she was she had lots of different husbands and lots of different you know she was a drinker you know she's an alcoholic like me and it, uh it, it, it's hard to be it's tough you know it's hard to be a family and then eventually when i was 14 uh when i was nine and a half my dad remarried married the next door neighbor and we did not get along at all because you know it's just a, i'd had my dad all to myself with my brothers and sisters now there's a woman there and she's living in the house and we didn't get along at all, and she had my stepmother, Ruth, who I have a great relationship with now, she came with a lot of corporal punishment. That's how her family was. She's from kind of a hillbilly family down there in Iowa, and they, there, was, there was stuff that, you know, it was a lot of beatings and spankings and constant smacking and slapping and hitting that I wasn't used to because my dad would, didn't do it. But uh, dad kind of said, hey, you know, she's going to be the mother here, so I've got to let her do what she's got to do. And, you know, she, and it, she tried to break me, as it were. And so we battled for many years. And when I was 14, my mother would always call up and say, I'm getting a lawyer, I'm getting you out of there. I'm getting a lawyer. And I go, all right, she's getting a lawyer. And then I wouldn't hear from her for three months or four months, you know. And so, uh, you know, that happened again and again. Eventually, when I was 14, um, a lot of the stuff at my home had calmed down, but there was still, you know, because I was older now. But my mother, I finally moved in with my mother and her sixth husband. And uh, I'll tell you, I, you know, my, my battle at that time was I wanted to grow my hair down over my ears. You know, I wanted to do a lot of different things, and there were so many rules at my dad's house. I moved in with my mom, and I remember getting there and uh, in their house, and she, pull, she pulled out a beer and said, listen, you can drink whatever you want. You can sleep with any girl you want. I don't care. Bring them home. You don't have any hours. You have to be home. Nothing. There's no rules here. 
and then she gave me a beer and she, she drank her beer and then she left and, and I just she went out to wherever and I just said oh I'm screwed yeah. you know this is not this isn't what I wanted because there are no rules and I had a big lump in my throat you know and I said this is bad too I eventually I lived with her for two years and then moved back in with my dad and stepmother and, and uh, we got along but a what bit. were you like what was I like? Well, I mean, if you could see that boy now. I do. I do see that boy now. Well, you know what I do is a lot of my childhood, as, as with most of us, I don't remember every little thing about it. Yeah. And I like to look at the pictures and stuff. And uh, here's how I, here's, here's a good example of me. There was a, I was telling Rosie a story. When I was nine, I went to this camp and there was a girl that was 13 or 14 there. And we went on a canoe trip and I was in love with all women because there was no mother in our house. So I was in love with all women. If they were older, I was just... And uh, we went on a canoe trip, and, and we rode down the Des Moines River for three days, and it was she and another uh, girl and me. And I was totally in love with this girl. I was nine. It was the first person I ever loved. And, and uh, you know, as, as nine-year-olds love them. And um, we got back to the camp, and I thought, you know, she probably liked me too, you know, because she's so nice to me. And uh, then we got to the camp, and everybody's saying goodbye, and then her boyfriend comes up, and he's a 14-year-old guy with hair under his arms. You know, I was like, <laughs> you know, how am I going to compete with this, you know? <laughs> so I... Uh, but I, I was thinking about this, this, this girl, and so I had somebody check. She's, she's from Macomb, Illinois. Her name was Melinda Kale. I'd remembered her name since I was a kid. And I had somebody check the high school yearbooks over there, and they found her picture. Rosie said, go for it. She said, I think this will be great. I asked her first. And, you know, I see her picture, and it reminds me. I, I remember exactly how I felt when I was nine. That's one great thing about family pictures. It takes you right back there. And uh, I think I wanted attention, and I wanted female attention pretty bad, you know, right. but, um, you know, that's, that kind of describes how I was as a kid, and I, I was also the oldest, I was protective of my brother and sister, and, uh, were you a smart, you no, know, I was really, I was a smart kid, I was also, uh, had trouble at school, acting out, you know, I was, uh, I got in, into a lot of trouble that way, and I think that, that hurt me, class but that's part clown of type stuff, class or, clown, or, uh, or... I would go beyond that, you know, I was, you know, I had arguments, I did, if I, you know, if I didn't feel that things were going my way, then I, I didn't, like it at all and I, I look back and I didn't like myself as a kid very much you know I, I just felt like I wasn't cool enough you know as the other kids are you know in our town as small as it is there's such a big class division you know there's the doctors kids and all this stuff and man I just did not feel part of that and I just I wasn't a part of it and I just felt like you know and that's how I felt my whole life it's not not quite good enough you know it's weird but I can remember that feeling still to some extent still yeah yeah of course you know but I, it's something I really work on and I, I wish I, I could say I was, was healthier. If I was, I would weigh 200 pounds instead of 230. But I, I still, you know, I'm working at getting there. I feel a lot better about myself. And I'll tell you, one thing, when you have success, boy, that, that messes with your head if you don't have a lot of self-esteem because you go, boy, I don't deserve this. But what I do is I say to myself, well, does the seven-year-old Tom deserve it, Tommy Arnold, the little kid? And I say, yeah, he deserves to grow up and have success. So I can deal with it that way. Take a break. We'll be right back. So why don't you just make yourself comfortable, you know, put on a bikini and some black high heels and, uh, and this dog collar, and uh, I'll be right back with you. Oh, I can't wear bikinis. They show my scars. What scars? Uh, from my sex change operation. <laughs> somewhere else I wish you weren't I wish you were here with us uh, we're talking with Tom and we will be talking with Roseanne Arnold uh, your grandfather your father they were in a real meat packing place. grandpa Tom uh, Graham he worked for 50 years at Morel Meats in Ottumwa and my dad worked at uh, Morel's for a while my, my uncle and most of the people in my town it was meat packing it was a meat packing town did you did you graduate high school Yes. You got through that? Uh, yes. And then I uh, went right into the meatpacking plant for three years. I worked at Hormel. Uh, Morell's had closed down, and I worked at Hormel for three years, which was the best job in town. And I was really lucky to get that job. What did you do? Oh, I did it all. I, uh, one of my jobs is called leaf lard, pulling leaf lard, which is the fat on the inside of the ribs. As the, as the pigs would go by, I'd pull the fat out, and that, that, that was hard on my fingernails. You know, I still... <laughs> I did. I drove hogs. I worked in livestock. If a hog was uh, had a broken leg or something, it was my job to shoot it in the head, and that's how. 
hey, it puts them out of their misery. And uh, that's how I got my nickname, Gunner. And uh, I did a lot of stuff, you know. I did a lot of Do people ask you, did you kill the animals? Is that, that's mm -hmm. one, when I heard you really worked the meat packet, yeah. the first question I said, did he kill? Yeah, I killed a bunch of them because, you know, the ones with broken legs that were suffering, you know. Who and killed? I ate a lot of them, too. And I still do. Who kills the other one? Who oh, uh, there's a guy. It's, it's one of the best jobs there. What you do is the hog... I would drive the hogs up a chute, and they would go up the chute, and if they got to the top, this guy had a thing like this that was, had electricity. He put it on the hog's back. It would shock the hog. It would knock him out. He would put uh, his left foot up, uh, foot, hoof, up in a, in a chain and pull it up in the air, and it's laying, and then he'd cut his throat, and the blood would come right down. <laughs> that way the blood doesn't stay in the, in the pig and ruin the meat. Do you know how people feel about that? I, I think, it, yeah, it sounds pretty harsh. But, you harsh? Know, <laughs> but I tell you, it's the most humane way to do it. You know, it is the most humane. Believe it or not, there's no humane way to kill an animal, I don't think. But I personally am okay with that. I'm you, okay with eating meat. But you just made a whole audience of vegetarians. I hear that. I hear that. You know, you think I would be too, after you know, because you're in there, yeah. you're seeing this stuff. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a rough business. And you liked what you did there. Well, I didn't happy. like killing the hog. No, know? no, but you were I, happy there. I was pretty happy there. But, you know, I was 18, and I was going to get married. I'd met this uh, girl in uh, Missouri, and I was going to marry her. She was 17, still going to high school. And uh, I was excited about it. And then, you know, I, suddenly I was, saw myself working there for 50 years, like my grandpa. And I just started, the wall started closing in on me, and then I broke off the engagement. And then... Uh, Why? Why did she have to suffer? Because you didn't want to spend 50 years in the meat plant. Actually, she did. She being suffering, getting away from me. Yeah. It's the best thing ever happened to her. She married it, but she married this guy, other guy about a month later. That, that was that we were all the three of us used to hang around together. But uh, you know what? I wasn't ready for marriage, Sally, and it would have been tough. She would have had to move from Missouri up to Iowa, and then I was, you know, I was drinking all the time. I was 18. I mean, I'm, you know, that is too, too damn young. Was she your first real love? Um. Oh, you know, there are, I had a lot of crushes, but, you know, nothing compared, you know, your first real, true love is, is definitely Roseanne, because, I mean, I'm talking, well, I would have said that if I, before I met Rosie, I would have said, well, you know, it might have been her, it was her, and there's some other girls in high school that I loved, you know, but I mean, true love, you don't even know what it is till you got it, and, and a man, it's something else. You know, it's it's a really. But great. you know why you strike someone as having gargantuan appetite for everything, oh, yeah. for life, for mm -hmm. whatever you're using or abusing, right. and I would think you'd feel that way about sex too. Well, you know what, uh, we, uh, I I wanted a lot of my buddies, recovering alcoholics, are also recovering sex addicts. I wanted I wanted to have sex with a lot of people. I wanted people, women, to like me a lot. And it just, it didn't work out that way. Because I was such a, such a drunk, you know. I mean, you know, I was just, yeah. I was just bad. And I was bad news. And even when I started performing comedy, I'd go on the road and I was kind of like this star, you know, at least in this little club for this night. And women would not sleep with me. They didn't like me. And uh, I just, I said, man, you know. Why wouldn't they if you were the star? When, I mean, you see these groupies that'll sleep with anything. You, you know what I used to, the, there are people that won't sleep with anybody. I mean, really? you know. <laughs> Not on our show. But I, uh, they just, I just don't, my, my vibe or something, and other guys, the opening act would, would meet somebody, and I'd be back in my hotel room by myself, you know, and it happened a lot. Most women today think you're terribly attractive. Is that true? I guess it has to go from here to somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> I understand that. That is true. You got to feel good about yourself. Why'd you start doing comedy if you were in the meatpacking plant? I'll get well, you off the hook here. I went to, uh, I started going to night school, college, in, in my hometown. And uh, I uh, got fired from the meatpacking plant. Why? For, I got, after working there three years, I got arrested for public nudity, streaking. <laughs> I, I called in sick from the jail. I called in sick and they read it in the paper and they called me in the office and fired me. And then I was depressed. I was so scared, but then I thought, this is the beginning of something good, I have a feeling. <laughs> I didn't have any money for school, and I wanted to continue going to school because I thought that was my way out, right? 
So I walked from Alvey, Iowa to Tum, Iowa at the end of November 1980 in my underwear, took pledges, made $2,500. I mean, people sponsored it. It was the first time I was ever in the, in the National Enquirer. Did all this stuff, and I paid my way through college. That was enough at that time to get me from, from Indian Hills, which is a junior college, to the University of Iowa. At the University of Iowa, my first year there, they had an open mic night. And it was for comedians, they were playing a guitar or something like that. And I said, I want to do that. I, I think I can be a comic. So I went there and I brought all my friends and it was just great. You know, we had a big party and we all went down there. And I was so funny, you know. Were you looped? Oh, looped. We were drinking Everclear. You ever drink that stuff? It's like 190 proof. <laughs> I don't recommend it. We were all looped. And the second night I did it, we weren't. And I was bad. I was bad. I was, you know, it was, but I, but I caught it, caught the bug and I wanted to do the comedy. The monkey on the back. Well, I had the monkey on the back before. I see, I never, when I lived in Iowa, I just drank. I never did any drugs. And I thought that I was okay just to be a stinking drunk, right? I, but I said, oh, drug addicts, they're screwed up. But me, I just drink, you know, every day till I black out. That's okay. But I, <laughs> and I went to, when I moved up to Minneapolis in 1983, you know, I started doing cocaine a little bit, you know, and it that became yeah. my whole thing. And, uh, you know, just took over just like the booze was, just like anything is, just like food can be right now if I don't watch it. Where did you get the jokes? I took jokes. Well, first, my first time I performed, I got them from watching other people on TV. I watched, stole their jokes. And the second, and then I started writing jokes about myself, which is, I wrote jokes about how bad my family was. And uh, <laughs> they loved it. And I wrote jokes about, you know, how many times my mom had been married. I, I took exactly stuff and just told stories about, well, this happened. And, uh, you know, my mom's one of her husbands, the last one was named Delmer, and his dad was named Elmer. You know, I didn't have to make anything up, but people just thought it was funny. And uh, that's how I got the material. What was, all right, did you go around, as we think people do, from comedy club to comedy club? Yes, yeah, so I moved to Minneapolis. That was my home base. And then I traveled throughout the Midwest. And once in a while, I'd come to New York and, and stuff like that. But that's, I made, mainly stayed in the Midwest from 1983 till 1988 when I moved out to uh, California to write on the Roseanne show. How old are you now? In, in now this minute or now when I, meet, <laughs> when I met Rosie? No, 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 no. How old are, is Tom now? I'm 33 now. When I met Rosie... That's all? Yeah. You're only 33 years yeah. old? You're only 33? <laughs> Do you believe him? I swear to God, I'm 33. March 6, 1959. Uh, we'll have uh, him explain how he met Roseanne, and if she wants to say it didn't happen that way, that's okay. She's allowed. We'll take a break. All right. <laughs> okay, I see what's going on around Jackie, here. Jackie, they made us do this. <laughs> oh, this is great! <laughs> They're spinning off my show! <laughs> now I know how proud Ben Cartwright felt when little Joe got his old little house in the prairie! <laughs> How do you feel about gay white couples raising black children? The whole situation is, is making a mockery of the traditional family values. You should thank God and commend these people. Next Sally. I like watching it. Do you? I like the show. We, the... we left you when we said, uh, and then I moved to L.A. Yeah. So you have to explain why you moved to L.A. Well, I moved to L.A. to, to write on Rosie's show. I'd no, met, how'd you meet Rosie? I met Rosie in 1983. I was 23 at the time. I was a young man, and uh, I met her in Minneapolis. She came to perform, and I was her opening act. And uh, the guy that booked the club says, I, there's this woman from Denver. She lived in Denver at the time. It was a couple years before she moved to L.A. He said, you guys are getting along, along so good. Your acts are similar. You'll just, you'll be so much fun. And so I remember, uh, you know, the first moment I met her, I was late at the club as always, and they were waiting on me. And I remember she was getting some coffee and she turned around and he says, hi, this is Roseanne, you know, her other name. And uh, I remember the exact minute I met her that night uh, after the show, we watched each other's acts. We, we loved each other's acts. We went out. I, I took her to all the parties in, uh, in Minneapolis. We ended up, you know, sleeping together, not, not sexually, but sleeping in the same, there's a comedy house there where everybody sleeps. We slept on the floor together. And uh, that's where I ended up pro proposing to her, you know, about six years later, that very floor from that very Aww. place. Aww. Yeah. That's 
so sweet. Yeah. Would you please give a welcome to Roseanne? he would be that you'd do a show and all of that that's not true oh, oh that, yeah no, that's, oh, that that's too. a made up publicity that's true I it is say true that. yeah what'd you say to him well it wasn't that night i don't think it, it, it was like when we knew each other a while and i'm like well you know the first night i met her she said it. i did oh. i said later on where's this party and i said so what do you want to do what do you want to do with your career you want to move out to la or something like that she goes oh yeah yeah i'm moving out to la and i'm going to do the tonight show and uh then I'm going to uh, get my own show, you know. I'm going to get my own show. And uh, it's going to be called Roseanne, and it's going to be number one show. But you can write on it if you want. Because I like the way you do your act. Of course, I she say that to every guy comic. I thought I'll let <laughs> She also asked me to be the husband on the show. She asked me, Are you, you're it. You're in the husband. So I call up my local newspaper, the Atomic Career. Hey, I'm the husband on this, this new show. It's going to be the Roseanne show. It's coming out. So then I find out she'd ask the three or four other guys to be the husband, too. <laughs> But it is a great line. It is a great line. I mean, it worked. Yeah, right? it did. Well, I did think he was really funny. The first time I saw him, I couldn't believe it. I, I had never seen anybody as funny as him. I still feel that way about him. And uh, he had this act where he had these goldfish, and he's, like, making them do tricks and all this really weird <laughs> stuff. It was so funny. And what was funny was the asides that he made to the audience just off the top of his head. And I never have, had seen anybody that quick ever and still. He blows people away with how quick he is, you know, um, all the time. But how did we he's get so from funny. there to he's moving out to L.A.? Well, we just became, I asked him to write jokes for me right then, you know, and, uh, and so he'd, he'd write some jokes for me and stuff, and we just became really good friends, and we'd call on the phone every few months, and he'd sell me some jokes, and then I never would pay him. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and Did uh, it get you angry that you wouldn't pay? Yeah, eventually, because she was so tight. I mean, even when I, I mean, I wrote, I wrote her, I would write these jokes, she'd do them on Carson, you know, she was using them, and even when I moved to L.A., I was still writing another act for her, she, we'd go over to Canners, this deli, to, so she could pay me, and she'd have two, she'd go, she'd owe me, let's say, $1,200, not much, she'd go, can, can you give me a break, I hate to pay my friends for stuff, you know? <laughs> then she'd go, okay, so she'd give me down to 900 then she'd write a check for 450 and another one for 450 she'd say, cash this one in a month, and this one in a, like six months, that's how you did it. She just felt that that would, she didn't want to violate our friendship, that's how our relationship was, we'd travel around together, she'd get a gig and I'd open up for her around the country somewhere and we'd go meet, yeah. and it was mostly an excuse, I think, for us just to hang out together. Because you we, think there was something there that... Well, I didn't want to admit it for about six years. But yeah, every time I'd get real scared and then I wouldn't talk to him for about six months if I had any feeling about him or something, I'd get panicked. Yeah. So it took a long time. And you, Tom? Well, I, I wasn't quite sure. You know, I didn't... Our friendship was so great. I was afraid to even, you know, think about the next thing because she's married and all, you know. And I thought... And she was such a good mother. That's part of the reason I was so attracted to her. And I thought, well, that doesn't... You know, she does... She must not like me in that way, you know. Once in a while, she would make... I can remember a couple of times she said things to me, and then I said things back, and it was after we'd had a few, you know. And then we're, we were both embarrassed about it after that, and we it be a while, but... It's the next morning syndrome. Yeah. Tom and Roseanne, you both look terrific. Thank How you. did you take your weight off? Uh, I had it cut off. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta move things well, we along. We dieted too. Honestly, we've been on diet for like two years, and it's very slow. It's very hard to change your compulsive patterns. And uh, but I had, uh, you know, you know, some some of that, and some I did have some. I had a big apron, it's called, because I'm so compulsive with food that I would gain or lose 80 to 100 pounds every year or year and a half. And I had four children. Also, I had a lot of like loose skin that I'd have to all up in a girdle and it made me look a lot bigger than I really was because I mean it was just hanging there and so I had that removed and I, I'm really happy. She feels real good about herself. Yeah, I good. feel real good about it. I want to post you nude wish. as soon as possible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
When you got out there, mm. you were a writer on the show? Yeah. Was he good? Oh, yeah. He's always been a great writer. I told him, um, write a script, hurry up so I can show it to the guy so he'll hire you. So, um, you know, usually it's like two, three weeks for somebody to work on it. He calls me the next day. He's got to complete a script overnight. And it was really, really funny. And we've used pieces of that script yeah. in quite they a few shows. Did, yeah. yeah. All right, so the, you went from that to what? What was the next stage? I'm trying to get you to the show. Oh, well, I, I, the I became show. a writer, and then uh, I became a producer then the next year. How long have you been writing and producing? How long? Well, this is the fifth year of the show, okay. and I've been producing for three years. Do you get any recognition for that at all? Uh, well, I get, uh, you know, I don't know. I, there should be some, because, you know, the show's improved since I've, well, he gets you know, it in in, Cal in, uh, in our industry. He that's has what a I lot meant of recognition. In the industry. And people yeah. love the show, and that means that, that's right. But I don't think that the general public or, and the press never hips to it, you know, but that the great changes in our show are, are largely due to Tom. Take a break. We'll be right back. Roseanne's husband fires writing staff. Roseanne's husband slugs photographers. Roseanne's husband moons the president. <laughs> Man, I love being famous. Now I even got my own TV show. Finally, I can tell all those people who think I'm riding on my wife's coattails. So what if I am? Tom Arnold stars in the Jackie Thomas Show, premiering Tuesday after Roseanne. about those provos huh talk to me about that oh they're oh they're real funny we did yeah. <laughs> no we did we did a lot of the we took the, the promos we took advantage of a lot of stuff that i hear about myself in the press and just turned it around on them some of them you know you just ad lib to yeah but, but i it, mean i you could either go that way or you can ignore it and then go yeah, yeah. Well, it's too funny not to ignore so we we just had a little fun with too it too funny to ignore <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay. See, that could have went by and it would have been okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. How the I <clears throat> how did the idea for the show come about? Well, I kind of always liked the idea of, uh, you know, doing a show that was about television because it's so funny. I mean, and, and the idea that I wanted to do was a show where you'd show like, a show within a show. I always like stories within stories. My first HBO special was kind of a show within a show too. So I guess I just expand on that idea and then, you know, we got his character and we made it, you know, it's sort of like, but you know, mean. He's mean. He's not mean. I he, don't think he's he mean. He didn't invite that lady to his party. <laughs> well, I'm I, angry about that party. I, I would have had to invite know. everybody. You know, I my character is he thinks he's the nicest guy in the world. He thinks oh, wait he's doing you a Wait favor. a minute, wait a minute. Oprah has a party and doesn't invite him, right? Thank you for using Oprah, not me. <laughs> so, he throws a big charity party, and the woman who does all the work, he doesn't ask her. That's oh, plain yeah. mean. Well, that's because... Well, he's, kind of, he's not... Jackie Thomas is... Uh, he's kind of really stupid. <laughs> but why and it's stupid? not so much mean as he's just really stupid. See, the thing is... And a lot of stars are really stupid <laughs> the thing is with jackie Thompson, you watch the show and you will see you'll learn more about his past his childhood and this or that and you kind of make starts to make a little sense about yeah, what, really, how this guy has gotten he's, 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 why make him stupid he, you're, you're not stupid no but i'm acting there i'm acting stupid it takes <laughs> you gotta be pretty smart to act that stupid I'll it's kind of we, we like to think of it as the jethro bodine character yeah <laughs> Hi, I want to ask, are you going to have a steady girlfriend on the Jackie Thomas show? Honey? <laughs> no. <laughs> are you an actress? Is that why? <laughs> we, uh, I'll tell you the thing about the show, too, that is, that is, is developed in the first uh, season, it, is that the, the people on the show besides Jackie, and I suppose including Jackie, they sure they work in television, but they're basically kind of a family. You know, as are most of us in our work environments, we become kind of a family of people. You watch them and see how they operate. That's why I feel that if you took these actors, or these characters, and you put them into something else, it would still be funny if they worked anywhere, taxi, you know, to any, anywhere. I think they have to be funny. It cannot, this show cannot be about show business. It can't be so inside because 
I'm bored with show business, you guys are bored with it, and everybody will be bored with it. But it's a, it be, you got to get into these characters. You both look great. Um, I was wondering if you were going to be doing any films um, in the near future. Yeah, we're going to do uh, one this summer. We're doing a feature film this and summer. I guess next summer, too. And then the summer two after movies, that. Two movies, two in a row. Summer after we that have too. seven Three, movies that are being Seven done. movies. Yeah. How are you doing? Hello. Hi. What Hi. are you doing? Do you want to tell me what you think of uh, Roseanne? Well, I think Rosie's great. Oh. Uh, she's a great daughter-in-law. and Oh, it's Ruth. Oh. We have a close family relationship. As a matter of fact, Rosie's a great cook, and at Thanksgiving time, she prepared a whole dinner for the family. Uh, she started early in the morning and made many great dishes. Her favorite which is one of my favorites, leg of lamb, was just fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Jack, what kind of son is Tom? Hi, Sally. Hey, Tom Rosie. Hi, Hi Dad. Dad. I'm incredibly <laughs> proud. <laughs> I'm really proud of Tom. He's accomplished quite a bit over the last few years, from his walk uh, at school, and from here to there in underwear, to his uh, real celebrity. Mm -hmm. Of course, watching Tom on TV is very exciting. Do you, you like know, the see, show? Seeing your own... Uh, Read it kid on TV is, is, is really something. We uh, we always watch the shows. Uh, we're quite proud of them, both of them. You have real parents. Yeah. I mean, they're real human beings. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. You, Thanks, Dad. Bye. 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 We'll be back. Are you dating or are you married to a really cheap guy? If so, call me and tell me your story. What has the reaction been when, uh, I think there were a few people who didn't like the show and you, you sent them a fax or a letter. What's the reaction been and how do you feel about that now? Well, I didn't send them a letter because they didn't like the show. First of all, that's not true. Okay. Um, he got about 90% excellent reviews, yeah. and I mean, a, lot, a couple reviews in like really big time paper says it's one of the 10 best shows that's ever been on television. So it wasn't about him getting all these bad reviews and me going out there. But these uh, three guys, you know, um, well, two of them, they just kind of bugged me because they, they, it starts off this great review with, I approach watching Tom Arnold's show as if it, it says some people prepare for uh, exploratory, exploratory surgery. surgery. He's the least funny man alive. And then at the end it goes, and boy was I surprised that it's, you know. So I just wonder, I, I faxed him and I used his exact words and I go, I approach reading your column like some people approach <laughs> anal warts. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I have to tell you, I've done the same thing. Yeah, because, I mean, why, why do they do <laughs> that? Good. You're either going to do it, you're either going to yeah. fight back, or you're going to keep quiet. And, My theory was always... And yeah, and back. this other guy, Howard Rosenberg, at the LA Times, why does he review comedy? He's never said one thing is funny, ever. He doesn't like anything. He, he hates TV. You know, he thinks... <laughs> I don't know why, why would he bother to have a job like that when he hates TV. To watch TV 24 hours a day, that's his job, but he hates it. <laughs> Hello, Tom. I would just like to know, how did you get to be so lucky to have the spot right after Roseanne's show? <laughs> oh, it was tr total luck. See, we didn't even... Uh... <laughs> we made this show specifically to follow Ros Rosie's show. I mean, we developed it to be a 9.30 Tuesday show. That's where it's set to go, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Quick question. Um, yeah, you had mentioned that you were trying to have a baby, and I was wondering if you planned to write that into the script if you did get pregnant. Oh, yeah, definitely. Take a break, Carol we'll be right back. Gained weight. <laughs> Hold all my calls. I want absolute privacy for exactly 30 minutes. <laughs> Accommodations for guests of the Sally Jesse Raphael Show are provided by the new Luxury Renaissance Hotel at Broadway and 48 in the heart of the New York Theater District. You guys seem like you get great, you're, you're just great together, but Tuesday nights, you sit down and watch each other's shows, 
back to back? We do it when we can. Uh, Rosie has therapy Tuesday you nights, know, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> the whole family, we watch it, we get the kids and force them to watch it, and we all do it together. It's fun. What would you like to have that you don't have now? What would I like to have that I don't have now? Yep. Well, a baby. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, anything else? No, Just a that's, baby? that's all I would like uh, to have. What is the place in Iowa like? I mean, it is, is it 1,700 acres. It is beautiful. It is a. That's Iowa, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. We have a game reserve. We have uh, horses and cattle, and uh, we're building a huge house there, and that's where we're going to retire. Are you really? What do you mean retire? You're 33 years old. <laughs> I mean, eventually, though, you know. Eventually retire. He yeah. wants to retire soon. I there retire might not now. even be anything by the I time. Know. I mean, you want to retire? I wish so I could retire right now. I really? Think. Yeah. No, well, you I, like, I really would. Why would you retire? Because I'm old and tired. <laughs> How can you be old baby? and tired and have a baby? But I won't be tired if I have a baby. But <laughs> well, maybe I would be tired. But anyway, <laughs> and I I liked what you said about children because only mothers know how how hard it is. Dream he, world. He doesn't have any idea. Take a break. We'll be right back. <laughs> If you'd like to order a video cassette of Sally's show for only $24.95, call Video Archives at 1-800-FOR-VIDEO. For a transcript, send $3 to 1535 Grant Street, Denver, Colorado, 80203, or call 303-831-9000. It occurs to me, one, two, that they've been married three years. So if you will please say happy anniversary to Roseanne and Tom. Oh, I can't believe it was three years. I can't believe it was three years either. It was like 90. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not supposed to say that. Now, awful. every day gets better. And That's we're, it. We're just yeah. so lucky. Are you signing on for another three years? Yeah. Well, we have a murder-suicide pact, so nobody can really get out of the marriage. <laughs> At least not alive. Yeah, at least not alive, but we don't tend to. No, it's great. It's great. It's wonderful. All right. Ha on behalf of all that of us, happy anniversary. That is such a beautiful shape. We'll Thank be back. you so much. Some members of our audience will receive and a promotional fee has been provided by... What, what, do you, what drop in ratings? No, it's nothing. We just dropped from fifth to seventh place, that's all. Was our lead in a... Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just dropped from fifth to seventh place, that's all. Was our lead in a rerun? No. Actually, it was, a, it was a new Roseanne. I know what's going on around here. I haven't been in these tabloids for a while, and people are starting to forget about me, and I'm starting to lose my fans, and I can't remember the last damn line, Jerry! Jerry, I'm so upset about the ratings! Yeah, I know. I am too. Coach was down too this week. Yeah, I know. Home improvement. <laughs> people are out shopping, man. It's not time to panic yet. We've only been on the air two shows. I smell your fear. <laughs> hey, you haven't lived till you've done it in a vat of... <laughs> Come on, honey! <laughs> Come on! You gotta pull your own weight, man! Quit riding my coattails! Come on! 